Thank you, uh, Professor Rutha. Uh, I promise you that this is the last time you're going to hear from me. <laughs> I, I wasn't supposed to uh, do this, but uh, the surveillance uh, slot was left empty, and so here I am. Uh, and I apologize if I haven't uh, covered everything in, in uh, detail that it should. Uh, I just want to remind you that uh, the arbovirus are everywhere in this world. It's hard to go anywhere um, without uh, being at risk for an arbovirus of one kind or another. Um, but to drive this home, if you look at the major infectious disease uh, epidemics that have occurred in the past uh, 20 years, uh, fully half of them have been caused by arboviruses. And most people, you hear all about the Ebola and, uh, and uh, MERS and some of the other diseases, but um, uh, arboviruses uh, collectively are probably the most, uh, one of the most important uh, public health problems we have to deal with going forward. And uh, just to state the uh, arbovirus uh, surveillance in most countries is horrible. It's not very good at all. Uh, we're uh, the uh, whole uh, uh, topic is complicated by the fact that uh, uh, there are at least three clinical syndromes caused by arboviruses. Uh, all of them cause systemic febrile illness. Uh, some of them are viscerotropic and cause hemorrhagic disease. Others are neurotropic and uh, cause uh, neurologic disease, and some of them cause all three of these, uh, these uh, syndromes. So it makes uh, differential diagnosis uh, clinically very difficult. You have to consider a whole range of uh, pathogens when you're uh, looking at these uh, agents. And it makes also the laboratory diagnosis equally difficult, um, the cross-reactivity that we see, and we don't have the technology really to differentiate between the different uh, uh, viruses. Uh, the unpredictability of uh, epidemics is equally uh, uh, confusing, uh, that makes it difficult. Uh, physicians are the front line in uh, most uh, countries, um, but very few of them think of arboviruses unless there's an epidemic uh, occurring. And so there's a low index of suspicion, especially during inter-epidemic periods when we really need to have uh, good, uh, good surveillance. Uh, many of these diseases, uh, the majority of infections are mild or mildly symptomatic, and uh, people uh, frequently uh, don't seek medical treatment. They uh, have self-treatment so the uh, illness doesn't get reported. And uh, we have no early warning system at all for, for these, uh, these diseases. It's also complicated by the fact that we have uh, to do uh, surveillance for the mosquito vectors or the arthropod vectors as well. Uh, so it's not just disease surveillance, it's entomologic surveillance, and, and, and you have to put these two together. And unfortunately, in many countries, the vector control people don't communicate very well with the epidemiolo epidemiologists that do disease control. So it's a communication problem as, as well. So. I'm going to talk b about both of these a little bit. I'll start with entomologic surveillance uh, first. And the entomologist in the, in the room uh, can add to this. I'm sure I'm, this is a very uh, superficial overview. But basically, uh, what you need to know is the species of arthropod involved uh, or po potentially involved in an area. You need to know, uh, have uh, good information on their uh, geographic distribu distribution and ecology, um, where they're breeding, where their larva habitats are, uh, and mapping those. Um, you need to know something about the adult behavior, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, feeding preferences, which hosts they like to feed on, uh, at what time of the day do they feed, uh, um, just general adult behavior of the mosquitoes. Seasonal distribution is very important because that influences uh, transmission dynamics, whether there's insecticide resistance, and uh, ideally have some information about the infection rate from the various species involved. Um, so that's a lot of information to, to collect, uh, uh, but it's, um, it, the good, good news is, is once you've collected this information, you don't need to do it on a weekly or, 
um, a monthly basis, you can uh, sort of uh, do it periodically throughout the year. Throughout the year. Uh, the other good news is, is that with entomologic surveillance, a lot of these um, uh, viruses, uh, as we learned yesterday, are transmitted by the same species, and so you can actually um, uh, use um, uh, the same entomologic data for multiple uh, diseases. And this, is, of course, is true for dengue, yellow fever, Zika, and chikungunya, and uh, others. Uh, others. So that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say on entomologic surveillance. I think the um, uh, speakers later in the day will be uh, talking uh, in more, more detail. Uh, disease surveillance, um, uh, for the most part, is passive in most countries. Um, uh, but if we're really serious about uh, having some early warning about epidemic activity, we need to think active. We need to have a more active or an enhanced uh, passive uh, system in, in place. Uh, passive surveillance um, is, uh, relies on physician reporting. They're, as I said, the front line. And uh, uh, if they're not well informed, then your uh, surveillance system will, will hurt. Uh, ideally, uh, we want to work with case definitions, standardized case definitions for the various uh, agents that we're dealing with. Um, it ideally be uh, passive surveillance uh, reporting would be uh, mandated by law. Uh, and basically, you use this kind of uh, surveillance data for monitoring secular trends. It's not much good for anything else, uh, but it is good for monitoring uh, trends. There's a, a problem with sensitivity that I'll come back to in, in just a moment. But basically, for passive surveillance, you want to, you're looking at the whole spectrum of epidemic uh, uh, disease spectrum. The interepidemic period uh, uh, down here is important, uh, but even, even during epidemics, you want to have, uh, have case reporting so you get a pretty good idea of uh, the um, disease burden. Um, so the problems with uh, uh, passive surveillance systems is that it uh, really, uh, for all intent and purposes, doesn't exist for most arboviruses. Uh, if a physician, if there's activity in an area and uh, some uh, communications, physicians will be uh, reporting it. But uh, there's usually it's out of sight, out of mind, unless there's an outbreak in a place. Uh, so they don't uh, usually report because, as I said, it, there's a low uh, index of suspicion. Uh, there's a lot of misdiagnosis uh, by uh, physicians uh, because of the uh, extensive clinical overlap of these, uh, these diseases. And we don't have good laboratory diagnostic uh, capability in most places. Um, and uh, I've mentioned the mild illness and uh, uh, self-treatment. So bottom line is the uh, passive surveillance system that exists in most uh, countries are very insensitive and can't be used for any any early warning uh, uh, capability. For early warning, we need uh, either an active system or an enhanced passive uh, system. Ideally, what you'd like to do is be able to actively monitor uh, the disease activity in your catchment area. Um, you want to know uh, when, when it occurs, where it occurs, uh, what's causing it, uh, what kind of severity of disease is associated with it, and uh, the emphasis should be on the interepidemic period and not the epidemic period. Unfortunately, it's usually the reverse. Uh, uh, it, uh, most of the action occurs when an epidemic is, is uh, declared. Um, an active uh, early warning system will have two com both a passive uh, surveillance component and an active uh, or a proactive surveillance component. Um, basically, what you want to do in, uh, in the passive system is monitor viral syndrome or dengue-like illness, depending on what you're after. Uh, for uh, arboviruses, you want uh, the physicians to report all uh, hemorrhagic disease and all neurologic disease um, using uh, case definitions if available. Uh, for the active, proactive uh, surveillance, uh, we need laboratory-based uh, uh, sentinel system is the, probably the, the best because you can't monitor, you can't uh, uh, test all of the samples that come in from all physicians. So it's, what you need are quality data. So I've 
uh, always uh, uh, proposed that we have sentinel systems. You have sentinel laboratories that uh, are uh, physicians that collect uh, quality clinical and uh, uh, data and as well as clinical samples for, for testing. Uh, you should have a simple algorithm of testing priorities. Uh, what do you do with these samples when they come in? And uh, ideally, you want quality control provided by either a national laboratory or a regional laboratory or, or both. So the emphasis here in the early warning system is in this uh, uh, inter-epidemic period when there's no apparent transmission. A lot of these viruses cycle naturally in communities uh, silently. Uh, they present either asymptomatically or with mild illness that ne doesn't get reported. But if you look for viral syndrome, you'll find them. Uh, but you have to look for them. And so that's what allows you then to develop some predictive capability because at this point in the uh, curve, when incidence starts to increase, you pick that up. Even, uh, even if you don't have a uh, lot of samples coming in, if, you're, if your sentinel system is uh, geographically located so that you represent the whole catchment area, uh, it won't go too long before you pick up any changes in, in seropositivity rates, for example. Uh, and, uh, and so the idea is then in this, this part of the curve to be able to detect increased incidence. You can then send epidemiologists out. You can do some investigations to confirm it. But if it really looks, good, looks like an, an outbreak is occurring, then you can implement uh, your uh, um, rapid response to program and uh, ideally just cut the uh, top of the curve, uh, the epidemic curve off. Unfortunately, in most cases, it's not until this stage in the uh, epidemic uh, curve that it's detected by physicians and reported, and by that time, it's too late to really do anything about it. Uh, but uh, uh, control is implemented, and uh, usually by, by the time uh, by the time uh, we reach this, this uh, uh, part of the curve, the control is implemented, and then we can, uh, we can claim success in controlling the epidemic. So uh, it's, it's uh, not an easy process uh, to do. Uh, several years ago, actually 20 years ago, I guess, I, I proposed a system uh, like this for, uh, for dengue. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, it's uh, very complicated and, and expensive, and uh, most uh, countries uh, don't have the resources to implement it. But this is the type of system that we're going to need if we're going to monitor these uh, diseases, and not just dengue. Um, basically, a sentinel uh, physician or a clinic system that, uh, that actually geographically represents your catchment area. So you're, you have different ecological uh, conditions in the um, in the catchment area, and you locate your uh, sentinel clinics or physicians uh, that represent those different uh, ecologies. Um, you can use an incentive-based uh, system. Uh, uh, that's the easiest way. But uh, generally, if you look in a community, you'll find physicians who are very interested in in monitoring infectious diseases, and you work with those those uh, physicians. But what you want them to do is send you, on a regular basis, every week, a selected number of samples. And that depends on, the number depends on your laboratory capability, the uh, resources available to you. But you have samples coming in every week. And they're from um, uh, viral syndrome cases. Uh, and uh, they're tested according to a, an algorithm that allows you to monitor what's happening. Uh, uh, but it has to be tested in a, in a good laboratory. You combine that with a sentinel hospital uh, system. In any community, you'll find uh, a limited number of hospitals where all of the severe infectious disease cases go, or most of them go. And so you work with the infectious disease physicians in those hospitals and the pathologists and uh, basically uh, try and get samples and tissue samples from uh, all cases of hemorrhagic disease, all cases of neurologic disease, and all cases of uh, uh, viral syndrome that have a fatal outcome. And they're not large numbers of uh, cases, uh, so it, it, it's just a matter of working with uh, infectious disease physicians and pathologists in those hospitals. 
And then you combine that with what I call a fever alert system. Uh, every community has a lot of community health workers that are working for ministries of health. They're out uh, walking uh, the community every day. They know what's going on in those communities. They know if there's a febrile illness that crops up. Uh, but often they don't uh, don't report it back to the epidemiologist, or it doesn't get back to the epidemiologist. So what you need to do is have a good communication with those uh, community health workers. When they see something unusual, they report it to you. Then you can make a decision whether or not to send people out to investigate, to collect samples, uh, to get them into the lab. To uh, but it's this type of a system or some some combination of this that's going to allow us to develop early warning for these epidemics. Otherwise, we're always working, working uh, blind. Uh, so just a simple algorithm, uh, depending on the, uh, the virus that you're interested in, you test for it first. And if it's uh, negative, then you test for other, other uh, pathogens. If it's positive, you uh, then do a workup uh, virologically and serologically on that. Uh, what the goal is, is to link the uh, epidemiologic uh, disease uh, detection network to state-of-the-art basic research and diagnostic laboratories. And those laboratories don't usually exist in the ministries of health, but they do usually exist in universities. And this is where most uh, ministries don't uh, uh, collaborate with universities. For some reason, they uh, don't trust universities. <laughs> universities don't trust them. I, I'm not really sure why. but. But it's a good system to tap into the expertise that's in a country is to work with universities. So, uh, and ideally, uh, the program uh, should be country specific uh, with good lab and epidemiologic capacity, communications and leadership, and it should be a regional program if at all uh, possible. Um, so what we need is uh, more investment in sustainable country programs. Very few countries invest very much money into these uh, kinds of uh, uh, programs. Uh, we need regional reference laboratories. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we had regional laboratories all over the world. Uh, they were called Arbovirus Reference and Research Laboratories. They still exist, but they don't perform the same function that they did 30, 40 years ago. Um, we need standardized reporting requirements uh, at the global, regional, and national level. Uh, we need outreach programs to the medical community. Uh, this should be uh, a key component of any program to keep the medical community educated about what's going on in the community. And there needs to be regional coordination of the surveillance uh, uh, data. And I put this on, this is the uh, algorithm that I uh, developed in Singapore at the uh, Duke NUS Medical School. Uh, basically, the idea is to, for emerging pathogens, uh, to monitor uh, both human and animal infections in both rural and urban areas, have uh, good uh, clinical NEPRI surveillance combined with field epidemiology for investigation, uh, clinical characterization of, uh, characterization of uh, patients, diagnostic uh, screening and then pathogen discovery if it's necessary, if it's ne negative, and pathogen characterization. I think if uh, this is a, a, a much more complicated system than, uh, than most countries will ever develop, but it's the kind of thing that we're going to need if we're going to have early warning uh, capability for these, uh, these diseases. And I just finish by uh, telling you that uh, we all love surveillance. Everybody focuses on surveillance, but surveillance has never controlled any disease. You have to combine surveillance with, uh, with interventions uh, if, we're gonna be, if it's gonna be effective. So uh, with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you.